Ah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is uh, Energy 808, the cutting edge where Marco Mangelsdorf and I share thoughts every couple of weeks. Hi, Marco. Nice to see your smiling face. Hey there, Jay. Great to be back. I've missed you, my friend. And uh, we have uh, Ian Lin today, our special guest, uh, who's a blogger and who wrote a couple of articles about Huhonua, which is what we're going to discuss today. Uh, one about uh, some efforts on the part of Huhonua to affect uh, state government. And the other, uh, an article more recently that was republished in Civil Beat uh, regarding litigation of, of, of the ownership of Huhonua in San Francisco. Uh, very interesting, we're calling this renewable energy in, on the big island in the wake of, at least in face of, uh, the Honua litigation, I suppose you could say. Marco, can you give us a background on all this? And can you make a proper introduction of Ian? I think he deserves a proper introduction. Well, I'll do my best, Jay. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on again, Jay. And thank you so much, Ian, for being available on such short notice. When I read uh, your uh, latest contribution uh, to the Honua saga, as I'll call it, I thought I got to get in touch with this guy and see if I can make direct contact. And uh, thank you so much for your availability today. Much, much appreciated. I feel we got a little, uh, a lot of scoop Thanks. here to be able to talk to you. So uh, uh, Ian has been around for a long, long time doing great uh, reporting and investigative journalism. And uh, I so do appreciate that, especially in this day and age when, uh, when the media uh, has changed so dramatically and print media, of course, is morphing to something uh, uh, different than what it was. Uh, and great, the civil beat and Pierre Midyar and his crew and you are doing what you're doing. So I do want to express my sincere thanks for all, all that you guys do in terms of covering stories that don't lend themselves to, uh, you know, four or 500 words in, uh, in, uh, in a shorter version. Uh, so I thought it'd be a good idea to maybe to get into uh, just a brief history of Huhonu for those people who aren't maybe as familiar with it as those of us who are into the minutia. So for uh, decades, there was a power plant up in Pepekeo, up uh, Hamakua Coast, that was burning the gas, the uh, waste from the cane harvest. Uh, that came to an end when sugarcane came to an end here, essentially mid-1990s. And then uh, the Gila Coast Power Company, power company uh, decided to switch to a new fuel source after the gas, and that was coal. And that went on for approximately 10 or so years until 2006-ish when coal stopped being burned and uh, the plant was uh, idle. 2007 or so, a group of investors got to thinking, gee, what else can we burn in this power plant, make money? And uh, through the twists and turns now of 12 or 13 years, here we are. So there was a power purchase agreement uh, between uh, a group of investors, uh, Huhonua, uh, that was approved, uh, was it back in 2013? I think uh, for a power purchase agreement to burn uh, trees, biomass that was grown, that would be grown along the Humbukua coast. And uh, that was approved by the PUC and the milestones weren't met uh, that were agreed upon and HELCO declared it null and void essentially, HELCO, HECO uh, and HEI next year were all sued by uh, Huhonua for breach and that led to a second revised PPA that was submitted to the commission and approved by the commission in 2017 for at a lower a kilowatt hour rate. And uh, Henry Curtis, Life of the Land, challenged that. And that went up to the Hawaii Supreme Court. The court ruled that the 2017 decision under Randy Wasse, there and then chair Randy Wasse, the PUC, was in fact in error. And the decision was remanded back to the commission uh, now under Jay Griffin, uh, Jenny Potter, and Leo Asuncio. And the commission uh, ruled in July of this year that in fact, uh, they, they, they negated, they, they vacated the uh, 2017 decision to approve the PPA. That was uh, challenged by Huhonua. Uh, they asked for reconsideration. The reconsideration was turned down uh, by a decision that was announced back in July of this year, uh, if I got, no, no, I mean, excuse me, that, that reconsideration was turned down uh, several weeks ago. And now we have uh, Huhonua that has asked the, uh, the Hawaii Supreme Court for a writ of mandamus to essentially force the commission 
to reverse their, uh, their churning down of the uh, PPA that was before them. So, uh, and that's I think still I, pending. It's kind of a, an emergency request for an order for the Supreme Court. Not an appeal now, just a request for an, a kind of emergency order. And that's where it stands right now today. Which so is, on, that, I on that, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, as I understand it, just to wrap up, as I understand it, the, 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 the court has the option of denying uh, the request for writ of mandamus with, you know, all of the sentence or two saying, you know, uh, request denied, or they could conceivably say, we'll take it into consideration. We'll let you know later on. So as far as I know, that's kind of where we are now. And, and I'll, I'll turn over to, to you and uh, UJ and Ian for, for further discussion. So uh, obviously, uh, Ian, uh, there's a lot of money involved. <clears throat> and uh, there are arguments on both sides on the Big Island. Uh, some of them may, may be somewhat contrived, but there, there are people who would speak on each side of this, whether or who, who know it should be permitted to, to proceed. Um, and then uh, you wound up writing this really interesting article about efforts that Hu Honua made uh, a few weeks ago uh, in your blog. Um, and I wonder if you could summarize that article for us. That's the first one uh, where you really got into this. Sure. Um, I started hearing, I mean, I'm not, I haven't been a, a close follower of Hu Honua through the Public Utilities Commission. That's such a, a legalistic regulated process that um, it would drive you mad trying to keep up. Marco, I, I appreciate that you're, you're uh, digging through all that stuff. But um, I started hearing that there had there were there are efforts underway behind the scenes to to pressure various state agencies and state employees to actively support Hu Honua's effort to overturn the PUC. Whether it's legal or not, whether it's procedurally correct or not, no one cares. They just want um, the PUC to to be overruled. And two key senators, um, Donovan De La Cruz, who chairs the Ways and Means Committee, which is considered the most powerful, it controls the purse strings of the state, uh, and Glenn Morkai, who chairs the Senate Energy Committee, uh, have both been um, privately and, well, not even privately, quasi-publicly contacting agency employees, um, some office heads, and threatening them, you know, we, we need you to do this, we want you to do this, and if you don't do this, you know, where your, you know where your office is in the budget? I can tell you the line and the position numbers and those could all disappear if we don't get our way. At least that's how I'm told the conversations are going. It's getting very blunt and very direct. Um, it's, it's the kind of arm twisting that I would expect to be from some huge operation, not for something that at its best is going to produce 200 jobs, including all the ancillary jobs that aren't really related, or don't come directly from the company. And that's the, you know, exactly why this is happening. I don't know. There aren't campaign contributions. There aren't big lobbying expenses being reported. And yet somebody's um, got these guys revved up and, um, using up a lot of political capital on behalf of what is really a, a, a strange request to overturn years of this highly regulated process, legalistic process with a you know, wave of the hand and poof, we're gonna overturn it. Um, it's, a strange, it's a strange demand to be making. And you identified some of the agencies and individuals involved. I mean, the ones who received letters and, and calls. Can you identify, I mean, can you mention them? Well, the PUC, for example. Um, the, I mean, the individual commissioners, the, the PUC itself as a quasi-legal organization, quasi-judicial organization. Well, they're, they're um, I found in the, in the, uh, records of public comments on the Huhonua project, um, a copy of <clears throat> a letter sent by, uh, signed by Glenn Wakai to the chairman, actually to the commission, but he addresses it to the chair, dear Jay, James, Gr James J. Griffin. And <clears throat> his letter says, 
We talked earlier this year about the important role the PUC can play in expediting energy projects so we get our neighbors working again. It came, as, came to me as a shock that the PUC did just the opposite on July 9th, the day they made the Huhonua decision. So he admits, I was there earlier this year. I talked to you about Huhonua. We told you what we wanted. I'm shocked that you didn't do it. That's, that's pretty blatant. Yeah. Then there, was a, there was this very strange affair involving some uh, spoof letters. Um, I don't recall whether that was in your blog or whether I just read that in the no. newspaper, but what do you, are no. you familiar with what happened? Um, I'm not. I just know that uh, the PUC identified several letters out of thousands that were form letters that were sent through a Huhonua company website in support of the project. And they found a handful, a half a dozen that didn't the person whose name was on it said they didn't write such a letter. Yeah, right, I remember. Yeah. Right. And it look, it's more like, hey, don't pay attention to the big thing over here because I got these six letters I'm worried about. It's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a sideshow that really has no relevance to this, the bigger question of um, how, uh, why this is being done, why the pressure on the PUC in this particular case um, you know, have you have you ever seen your you've been doing investigative reporting for uh, a lifetime. Um, have you ever seen this sort of thing before <laughs> where a given you know party and interest approach so many government and agency government individuals and agencies with these kinds of demands and threats. Well, in this case, the senators, I'm not sure what their interest is. That's the problem. Right, they're interested. They say they're interested in jobs, but these, this is a manini number of jobs that this that this project promises to uh, produce, if it, if it ever succeeds, um, it's more likely to collapse under its own financial weight and mismanagement, from what we can tell from this litigation going on in California. Ah, what a perfect segue, Ian. Um, <laughs> that was the, <laughs> that was the second article. Uh, and that is truly remarkable. I really, I had, a, I had to pull over and sit down and take a look at that one. Uh, this is the article that was uh, reprinted, so to speak, in, in Civil Beat not too long ago. Can you, can you yeah. summarize that one? Because that is dynamite. That's about the ownership and, and uh, legal litigation between owners. Well, let me, let me back into it. I got interested because um, I was reading the press reports about who was appeal to the Supreme Court. And so I downloaded the application they made to the Supreme Court. And here's, um, I won't say which publication this is from. This is common of similar to many others. Their story announced Honua Ola Bioenergy submitted a filing with the Hawaii Supreme Court on Wednesday, blah, blah, blah. Well, Honua Ola is, uh, is a new name for Hu Honua, okay? The company hasn't really transitioned over. They've transitioned some things, but not others. But when I went to look at the Supreme Court document, there was no Honua Ola mentioned anywhere. It was from Hu Honua, filed on behalf of Hu Honua, signed by five attorneys who work for Hu Honua. So that got me interested. So who is Hu Honua? And I started just doing preliminary uh, research and stumbled across a court case that's been pending in California for... Um, not quite two years, I think, um, yeah. in which the lead investor in Huhonua says the project was and is a multi-million dollar financial disaster, a fiasco from the beginning. Those are pretty strong words for someone who apparently individually has sunk at least $40 million of her own money into trying to keep this project afloat. Who, who is this person? You, you went into some detail in your article. Um, the, the lead investor is Jennifer um, Johnson. She is the currently the, I'm not exactly sure if she's been elevated. She was the um, chief operating officer of, the, of Franklin Resources, which is the company that controls the Franklin Templeton family of funds. They have reportedly some um, $700 billion under their management. And she's the 
daughter of the billionaire owner of the San Francisco Giants, um, the majority owner, excuse me, of the San Francisco Giants. And her brother is the chairman of the, the Franklin Resources. So it's a family affair, a lot of rich people, a lot of money. And since 2013, maybe a little bit before, she's been the primary financial backer of Huho Nua. Uh, but you would, it sounds like from the tone of what's being said in, in the court proceedings now, um, you know, the glow's off the rose here. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, the wheels are falling off this, this financial uh, buggy. Um, she, she is in a dispute. Basically, she, re she removed the um, person who was managing her investments in Huho Nua. Um, Harold Robinson. Uh, in 2018, she says she got fed up with how much money they were losing and basically gave him the boot. He was an at-will employee, she says, of her investment co uh, companies. Um, Robinson turned around and, has, and filed suit against her saying he was due millions of dollars. I think he claimed something like $17 million based on what he says was a certainty that Huho Nua would be approved, a certainty that the Hawaii Supreme Court would uphold the former um, purchase agreement, power purchase agreement. And based on that certainty, he said, you owe me um, a share of the, your future profits, which, will, which if the project were built, those future profits would be substantial. They are, they are locked in a, you know, a very bitter uh, legal proceeding. Now we get into... Uh this lawsuit in San Francisco, uh, which has um, national firms doing it um, and have uh, uh, three law firms are involved in this lawsuit, uh, filing papers as if there were no tomorrow. This is a major lawsuit. Right. Uh, yes, involving it's huge. Thousands of you know, pages and, and uh, tons of trial documents and so forth. So uh, I, have to, I have to say now as a, you know, a formerly employed investigative reporter, now mostly an investigative blogger. Okay. I'm stunned that with all the attention on Huho Nua for years, that no one came across this litigation previously. That's, that's just blows my mind. Um, that's, you know, a sad state statement on the um, status of our news media today. Yeah, I, I would have to agree. So uh, what, what the, you know, how, how is it doing? Um, uh, my guess is it's been going on for a couple of years. Um, they've been aggressive, both sides, yes. dealing with it. And uh, it's, it's coming on for trial soon. What's, what's the si situation? Well, it's set for trial in January, um, sort of late January. Um, they're, they're fighting over preliminary trial matters, uh, how the jury, what the charges to the jury will be, and, you know, a lot of, um, miscellaneous things, but pouring in the process, both sides have been filing um, legal briefs with huge numbers of attachments, including for all these formerly secret financial um, documents, uh, projections, consultants' reports, um, emails. Uh, we're starting to get a little better idea of how how Huho Nua has been funded in the past. Um, uh, Jenny Johnson contends that Mr. Robinson as manager failed in his efforts to bring in outside investors. And there is some evidence that in the 2014 period when the company was really under financial stress, they were being, their contractor was walking away, people were filing liens against them, they weren't paying their bills. Um, and one of the major investment groups that had come in, they put up, put together something called Grandest Ventures One. And Robinson had put this together with another person in, a, in San Francisco. And they had taken in, I believe, uh, I believe they'd taken in $30 million. They were still had another 30 million they were trying to collect. And Grandest wanted out. And so Basically, um, Johnson, using a, several different investment vehicles, bought out their interest. They also 
bought out the interest of a, a controversial Irish businessman, um, Andy Ruhan, who had also had a stake. I don't know what the original stake was. It may have been part of that $30 million, but uh, he also wanted out in that 2014 period. And the records in court now show that Johnson bought him out for another $5 million. There were reference, references to her father putting in as much perhaps as $100 million, oh. although I haven't found any, I found papers saying he was thinking of doing that, he was willing to do that. I'm having to pour through to see if he actually did that. Yeah. So there's a lot of money um, that's been gone in. So uh, Ian, you know, there's a lot of money here. There's a lot of players. Uh, this is yeah. big time, big time, um, you know, business deal and big time yeah. uh, legal dispute involving, it sounds to me like everything they ever did together is that yes. issue. Uh, a number, a, a huge number of counts in the original complaint for various, uh, you know, contract, uh, contract uh, breaches and the like. So <clears throat> I guess the, the question I would, I would ask you after you've looked at all that material is um, a lot of these things we didn't know, meaning we, the state of Hawaii, as you mentioned, the readership, the, the consuming public, the uh, people in the energy community, the people in the, in the energy regulatory community, we didn't know about this. Um, and it does affect the ownership and therefore, uh, you know, the direction of the who knew a company. And so my question is, does it, does it help explain why uh, who knew has been so aggressive um, in, in dealing with the PUC in dealing with the state legislature, the people in the state legislature they contacted, why they've been putting so much pressure on, on getting this, this approval um, right now, immediately? Um, I, I guess they're, they can see the handwriting on the wall and that, you know, four, $400 million could just go poof because it's, it's going to fall, fall apart on it. It's, it is falling apart on its own. And uh, the only thing that can save it is some dramatic um, bypassing of the regulatory system that would allow them to proceed. You know, all this started back in that period when to the uh, mid 2000s when you know, everybody was thinking renewable energy ethanol right we can grow, on the mainland they could grow corn and turn it into gas and they made us put ethanol in our in our gas as a mix and we still we're still uh, living with that and you know on the big island people were were buying up leases thinking we could grow any we could grow sugar on the old plantations turn that into ethanol and it seemed, didn't seem like a bad idea then because there weren't a lot of alternatives of renewables. But in 10 years or 15 years, solar has just changed the world. And uh, that didn't exist when Huhonua um, was, was envisioned and when the first um, power purchase agreement was made. And now it's a whole different world. And that's what the PUC has said. That's what Hawaiian Electric has said. Um, and I think, I think that new world is, is just upending this gigantic investment. Yeah, and well, and, and it's also a question of feasibility itself. Uh, even if you say that their business, their, their energy production model was acceptable, still, um, there's, there's a question of the, the federal tax credit, uh, which yes. I, I, I understand is going to expire at the end of the year. There's, a, there's millions of dollars, you know, significant millions of dollars are involved there. And if they're unable to get uh, get a, a, an approval of a purchase power agreement and all the permitting they need to go ahead, they're going to lose that. And that changes the, the feasibility calculation, doesn't it? It does, yes, because it's almost some, the tax credits from what the documents submitted in court require that um, all appeals or appealable things be settled before they can finally um, be approved to get the tax credits. And as you can see here, <clears throat> uh, this, this thing could be, could bounce around in the courts for a while. Yeah. Certainly be, way beyond the end of this year. Yeah. Easy, easy to imagine that. Uh, Marco, uh, you have some thoughts, questions you want to express? Always Jay, always. Uh, three weeks ago, Jay, you were talking to my friend Warren Lee. You pressed him repeatedly asking him at least three or four times, uh, who's behind this, who's behind this, who's writing the checks? And he finally answered it was Jenny Johnson. 
And then he applied, he, he essentially implied explicitly, he said, why should it matter? Why should it matter where the money comes from? And I find that rather striking. I found it rather striking. And lo and behold, three weeks later, uh, we find, I believe, that the money does matter. The, the background behind the money, the motivation behind the money, the interest behind the money, to what extent it jives with the health and well-being of our state, of the people on this island, to me, is even more in question than it was three weeks ago. So uh, I think my question for you, Ian, is how do you square... The, the reality that apparently Jenny Johnson and her team are saying, this has been an unmitigated disaster for years. It's, 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 we've lost money. We continue to write checks uh, and we haven't seen, we're not going to see probably uh, the, any type of return. And yet publicly, Huhonua has been 100% doggedly pushing and, 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 and applying pressure more so than I've seen in the 20 years that I've been in this energy arena here intensely in Hawaii. More doggedly, more kind of scorched earth, more political pressure, pressure everywhere, anywhere and everywhere. How, how can you square the, this is a disaster with full speed ahead, we're gonna get this done, it needs to be done and we'll do everything practically it takes to get it done. Well, the company had um, consultants reports from quote unquote experts uh, which predicted, firmly predicted, that after the state Supreme Court sent this back to the PUC, that the PUC would quickly come up with approving the project. And so up until J July of this year, I think they were assuming, well, the consultants are saying it's going to be in our favor, so we shouldn't worry. It's just a little road, road uh, bump in the road, you know, nothing to worry about. And when July 9th came, well, actually, for a year before July 9th, um, Johnson was, was in court saying, we've just poured hundreds of millions of dollars into an endless series of losses. And uh, she, I, I can see she was hoping that that risk would be rewarded when the PUC finally gave their approval. And now it's very clear that's not going to happen or not going to happen in time to help out this company. Yeah. yeah, you know, so we should try to, you know, identify lessons to have been learned here in energy and Hawaii, as, as you said, Ian, I mean, you know, 10 years go by and things change. Uh, <clears throat> the desirable forms of renewable or semi-renewable, if you like, uh, change in 10 years and it'll happen more. It'll happen again. But there must be lessons that uh, we can learn. I mean, for example, some people. Well, here's say, another. Well, in in this case, for years now, this has been uh, at legal risk, right? As soon as Life of the Land filed their appeal and went into court for years, um, the company knew, everyone knew, this might not go forward. And yet, during that period, they were still out trying to get money, getting her to put in more money, trying to find other people to put in their money even though they were at risk. We've been here before. This is kind of like the super ferry when the company did all this stuff knowing that they were at legal risk, that they didn't have approval to go forward. So in this case, it's again, they've, they've, I can see you do it with your own money, right? I don't mind risking my own money or I, I don't feel bad about it. But when you're going out to try and get investors money and doing all this, knowing that you could lose and you could not, you could be, you know, out of the game soon. Um, that's a problem. And that's what I think some of these businesses have to understand. Jay, let, let me riff on that for a moment. Please. It ties in perfectly to what, what Ian said. Uh, it is my understanding that unless and until two things happen regarding uh, a power purchase agreement, unless the appeals process, whatever that's going to be, however long it's going to take, unless and until it plays out, assuming there is an appeal, which there was, of course, with Henry, right? Or the appeal period, the clock is run out, then it makes very clear that the deal, the PPA should not be considered a done, done, done deal. Therefore, an investor is uh, taking a substantial risk at pumping in millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, 
additional dollars prior to the appeal period running out or all appeals having run their course. So what do you think? Is that the lesson we've learned? Is that the lesson? That is a very big one. That is a very big one. Yes, the power purchase, the independent power producers would do very well to, to look at this uh, cautionary tale that you don't, uh, you don't uh, count your chickens or whatever metaphor you want to come up with. You don't count them until two important benchmarks play out fully, the appeals process or the timeline to allow for the filing of appeals. Yeah, and you have to gauge your, your moves on that basis. You can't make any big assumptions until you've got those things in place. Uh, well, uh, you know, unless, you, yeah, you're putting other people's money at, uh, at risk. It would, be, it would be better, don't you think, that if we had the, the people with the ideas here, as entrepreneurs here, and the capital here. In this case, it wasn't quite like that. The people with the ideas were not here. The people with the capital were not here. Um, I, I don't think we'd have this conversation, actually, if, if, if this had been a truly Hawaii project. You, you guys agree? I do. That's probably the case. They would certainly have known the, the landscape, political landscape better, <clears throat> and the economic landscape. Yeah. Well, Ian, I, I want to I want to compliment you as I have on other articles in the past on your investigative reporting. It, it takes a lot of work and effort and you know focus to do this sort of thing, and and Lord knows we don't have enough of you. And I wonder if we could clone you at some time or encourage young people trying to get into journalism uh, to do the kinds you think the things you do. Uh, we need that in, in our community. We need that for better government um, and for better business, if you will. So I, I like to express my admiration. Thank you, Ian Lynn. Thank you, Thank Marco Mangelsdorf. Thank you. Thanks.